So there's a lot of things to consider before going solar. You want to make sure your home qualifies. Things that play a huge role are the condition of your home, energy efficiency, the age of the roof, how many people live in the home, types of electronics, lifestyle habits, trees, and any other obstacles that may be in the way. So first thing to look at is where the home is facing. My home is east facing and was built in 1996 and has the original 24 year old roof. I have several trees. I have a pine tree and a magnolia here, another magnolia and an oak tree here. It does cast some shade, but only in the morning. My neighbor does have a swimming pool with some palm trees, which I'm not too concerned about because I am using a microinverter system. This is the north side of the house, which we won't be installing any panels here since there's no production on this side. The backyard is west, and I have an oak tree and two pine trees here. We will be trimming them, as you can see how tall they are. My chimney and vents will cast some minor shade. My AC condensing unit is a 2003 14 sear 510 unit. Next, we need to know where the meter is located. Mine is located on the detached garage, and it is on the same wall as the breaker panel. There's a lot of information needed from your electrical panel, such as the main breaker size, the manufacturer, the label, all breakers, and any free breakers. So first, I sat down with the project manager. Before we could even assign a project coordinator to my project, we had to verify all the information required in order to proceed with the installation is correct, such as the utility company's net metering application and the insurance if required, if any city, state, county permits are needed, and the homeowner association's applications. This is typically a 30 to 45 day process. After all this is completed, I will then be assigned to a coordinator. Once we have the approvals, I will then be given an installation date. A typical roof mount system can be installed in a matter of a few hours. It's the approval process that can take the longest. Most homeowners aren't aware that we have the right to go solar, regardless of how strict they may be. We are protected by the federal government. Even if the panels have to be in the front of the house, in those cases, you just have to show evidence that the production is at least 10% or greater. I actually got back the approval for my solar first and was denied on the color selection of my roof. My association wanted me to select whether wood or equal. So I sent them an email with aerial photos of the subdivision with all the different color shingles in the area, as well as an explanation that the roof I selected was more energy efficient, had a better warranty, and won't look as worn in the next 10 to 15 years. Next, I sat down with a solar engineer. We started off by making a digital rendering of the house to take into account the roof space, pitch, hips, valleys, azimuths, vents, chimneys, fire codes, and any other obstacles that may affect the production of the array. I have a total of 4,427 square feet of roof space with 25 facets and seven ridge vents. Next, we looked at the height of the trees to see what kind of shade they were cast. This part of the roof has 477 square feet on an H12 pitch with a 186 azimuth that will fit 16 panels. The part next to it has 286 square feet on a 10-12 pitch that will have 10 panels. The west side of the house is 598 square feet on an 8-12 pitch with a 276 azimuth that will hold 10 panels. Those three areas had an available use of 1,361 square feet. My 36 panel system will only take 545. Next, we did a thermal satellite imaging to analyze the system production based on a day-to-day -day analysis of the season and weather patterns that broke it down by the month, day, hour. My home receives about 16 hours of usable sunlight per year, which is about 4.5 daily sun hours. So I'm guaranteed to produce 14,792 kilowatts annually over the next 25 years with my power production guarantee. That does factor in the 0.6% deterioration of the panels, so I should still have about an 86% production by then. Next, we started working on the one line diagram. This allows the electrician and everyone else involved to know what is being installed where and what is the purpose of the electrical component is. Here's the meter and the breaker box. We're going to put another breaker that's going to the disconnection switch required by the utility company in order to shut off my solar system and battery in case they ever need to work on the power lines their computers will show that there is a system active here so they can come out shut it down lock it down until they are finished and we'll come back and turn it on since my system is a hybrid system i will have two combination panels one panel is going to be for the breaker and the battery backup with 30 panels and the other will be for the grid tight six panel system here we are simulating what is going to be on the wall 
This is my AC disconnection box. Over here we have two in-phase invoice, which is the gateway for my system to communicate with the internet for my system monitoring. This one has 30 and the other one will have six. Inside, this is the combination panel with a critical load box. They will be moving all of my 110 breakers over to a new breaker box. So everything that you have here that's 110 volts will be able to shove over in your critical load breaker box. That way, whenever you do have a power outage, that battery will kick on and turn all that on. So phase one is here. We started off by making my house more energy efficient. Every house loses and uses electricity a little bit different. So by minimizing your wasted consumption, it maximizes the production of a solar array. The EPA's Energy Star program estimates that a typical household spends about a third of its annual cost on heating and cooling. Roughly $350 flies out right through the window through unintended gaps and cracks throughout the house. So we started off by depressurizing the entire house with our whole home air pressure test. Leakage that you have throughout the house. So um, read the two pressure units, one on each side of the screen. Left side is going to be your Pascal uh, pressure unit. Right side is going to be your cubic feet per minute. You want your leakage rate to be around your square footage. That energy that you know, you're using through the house, cool air is going to be escaping from somewhere. So you want the house to breathe, but you don't want it to breathe too much to where you're losing your AC. You know the size of your house? 2500. That'd be a solid number. So you got 18, 17 cubic feet per minute. So your leakage rate is in good shape as far as the house, the size of your house. Um, so it's just telling us that you're getting new air in the house, but you're not losing more air than you need to be. After that was completed, we did a whole home LED retrofit. On average, a homeowner has about 64 light bulbs. That's CFLs, condensing light bulbs, fluorescent light bulbs, LEDs. About 8% of your light bill is due to the types of lights that you use. So by switching to LEDs, it makes a big reduction in consumption. And then we worked our way up to the attic. We started off by doing a water heater wrap, which is like a thermal blanket for the water heater. It allows the hot water to be hotter longer and faster. After that was completed, we started doing an HVAC duct seal around the plenum. This will help keep the air the same temperature throughout the house and help avoid cold and hot spots. A typical house loses about 15% of the airflow that moves through the ducts because of leaks, holes, and poorly connected ducts. The result is a higher utility bill. Then we did an attic tent. This is creating a barrier between the attic heat and the living space. Especially if your thermostat is located near your attic door, this confuses your thermostat to thinking that it's hotter than what it really is. We finished off by doing our thermostat upgrade. We switched over to a Nest Smart Thermostat, which has a more accurate reading, as well as auto schedules, home away assistance, energy history, the home report, and my favorite feature is that you get to control it through your smartphone. Phase 3, Dev Installation. We started off by installing the Quick Mount PV Flashing L Mounts along with the Unirac Reading System. I will also be using the in-phase energy microinverters. So each panel is independent. So in the event if one ever fails, it won't affect the entire production of my array. Since my system does include lifetime monitoring, I will get alerts in the event if there's ever any failures. I will also be installing 36 LG Neon 2 335 watt monochristine panels. 
for a 12.3 kilowatt system. The panels do deteriorate 0.6% a year, can withstand category 4 winds at 135 miles per hour and hell as well. So I was just granted permission to operate. The switch is on on mode. I'm gonna make sure all the correct ones are on. I just turn on the battery. It shows that it's charging and at 22%. So right now the system is producing power. I'm sending the majority of my production back to the grid and charging my battery. Right now the house is pulling some power. So it took it about two hours and 45 minutes to go from the 20% reserve to the 99% to be fully charged. 